Now, where were we? In the boat with Jesus. It had been a rough night, terrible storm, so scary we thought we were going to die, and Jesus had this amazing power to stop the wind and the waves. If you've ever been in a boat where the, where the water was rough, you're just desperate to be on solid ground. Even if that ground isn't familiar, and in this case, they didn't land on the Jewish side of the lake, they landed on the Gentile side of the lake. And one of the ways they know is because of the smell. Now, I grew up in rural Ohio. I grew up in a town, but it was surrounded by farms. And whenever you wanted to go to the mall or to the next town over, you'd have to drive past those farms. Maybe a, a field full of corn or another field that had soybeans. You'd go past the dairy farm. And if you drove past a pig farm, even if, you, if it was a boiling hot day, you didn't have any air conditioning in your car, you'd be cranking the windows up because pig farms stink. They smell so bad. So these queasy disciples, they land on this Gentile shore, the smell of the pigs, and then they notice there is a cemetery, a graveyard, and a person is coming out of the cemetery, coming out of the graveyard. And he's not just like a mourner there for a funeral. They soon realize that he is living there and they can see why. He's dirty. He's got spittle in his beard. His eyes are flashing. He's got broken chains on his wrist. He had been chained up and the chains didn't work, covered in cuts and scars. And he's coming straight for you. And Jesus stops him and says, who are you? And the man says, we are legion. Now, that's not the man's name. It's the name of his problem. His problem is so big that he doesn't even get to say his own name. Legion is a military term for Roman soldiers, 5,000, 6,000 soldiers that would invade a place and take it over. And these demons inside the man have said not just that they are many, but they have taken over this man completely. But they've met their match because here's Jesus looking at them. And they know that he can do whatever he wants. So they talk to Jesus like he's a military commander and they say, command us to go. Now we don't want to leave this place. Command us to go into those pigs over there. So Jesus does it. Get into those pigs. Get out of that man. Now, have you ever heard a pig squeal? It is not a cute sound. It's awful. And then if there were 2,000 pigs going crazy, squealing and frantic and stampeding away from the farm, down the bank, into the lake, all around, surrounding the boat that Jesus and the disciples were in. It's no wonder that the people in that area begged Jesus to go. The sound of it, the economic disaster of it was terrible. They were probably ter terrified out of their minds. And if you were there, if you were a disciple in that boat, your heart might be pounding. You might feel afraid or disgusted, or maybe proud of what Jesus has done. But then you look at Jesus and he is still looking at the man. And the man now, he's still, he's still dirty, he's still got those chains, he still has those cuts, but his eyes are calm, his face is relaxed, and he says, he wants to get in the boat with you. Oh, and that makes sense, because when people are healed by Jesus, they want to follow him. Just like Peter and Andrew and Levi, they want to, he wants to follow Jesus, he wants to do things with Jesus, of course. But Jesus says, you I want you to go to your family. Yes, the family who were frightened of you, maybe because of the things that the man had done when he was possessed by the demons. Yes, the family who chained you up. Yes, the family maybe who cried while you were being chained up. The family who were trying their best to keep you safe from yourself, but also keep the rest of society safe. Go back to that family and tell them you've been set free. And the man did it. And he told everybody about Jesus. Before Paul, before anybody else was evangelizing to the Gentiles, this man who had a massive problem for years and years and years and was just waiting for something to work, here was Jesus. And he set him free from what had controlled that man for so long. So you get back in the boat and you go over back to the other side of the lake, the Jewish side of the lake, where there are people waiting to be taught to be healed. 
there's a man, an important leader of the synagogue who has arrived because his daughter is dying and he knows he wants Jesus to help. So Jesus is headed that direction. But first in the crowd and the hustle and bustle, something happens. There's a woman who is desperate. Now this woman, she hadn't been chained up in the graveyard like the man from the previous story, but she is suffering. She has been suffering for years alone. She's got some kind of problem with bleeding and we don't know what kind of bleeding it is, but we know that it wouldn't stop for 12 years. And how exhausting would that be? How worrying would that be? And expensive. She had spent all her money to try to get doctors to help her and they tried to help her, but they just couldn't. And because of the bleeding, because of the ancient society that they had, she had to be kept separate from everyone else for her sake and for everyone else's sake. She couldn't worship in the temple. She couldn't live in a tent with her husband. She had to be kept separate from everyone else. That was the rule for the community. And it wasn't out of cruelness or unkindness. It was just because she had this bleeding that couldn't stop, but she still must have felt lonely. And Jesus is on the way to this important work to help the daughter of an important man. And the woman doesn't want to make a fuss, but she's desperate. And I wonder, do you think she thought it out beforehand or did she just reach out? She just thought, I'll give this a try. Just, just try it because what does she have to lose? So she just touches Jesus' clothes. Isn't that great? She just touches his clothes when all these people are around and Jesus says, who touched me? The disciples, they might've thought that was strange or funny because there's so many people around. There's lots of people touching Jesus. But of course, Jesus knows who it is. He knows what people are thinking. He knows what's going on there. He knows power has gone out of him to that woman, maybe to other people as well. And, but most importantly, he knows exactly what this woman needs. And he gives her what she needs. Not just the healing from the bleeding, but he gives her the chance for him to look her in the eye and say, daughter. Not woman, not ma'am. He doesn't know her. There's no family relation. He just looks and says, daughter, you're healed. Do you remember when the man was lowered through the roof and he said, son, your faith has healed you. Jesus, remember, he's on the way to heal someone's precious daughter. But he starts saying to this woman, you are a precious daughter. You have been waiting. You have tried everything. You have been alone but I want you to know that you are loved and precious and belong. That's what Jesus says to her. But while Jesus was talking to the woman, the synagogue leader was standing there desperate, impatient for Jesus to come to his house to heal his daughter. And while Jesus is talking to the woman, the man's servant comes through the crowd and gives the bad news. The girl has died. But Jesus hears this, he hears this conversation and he says, let's go up to the house anyway. So Jesus and a few of his disciples and the father go back to the house where there's a crowd of people who are loudly mourning, weeping and wailing. And Jesus says, guys, she's only asleep. And they start laughing at him. Now imagine you're the father and you've just had that terrible news. And when terrible news is given to you, sometimes it feels like a punch in the stomach or a slap across the face. He's reeling from this news. He's probably angry that Jesus took so long and annoyed that Jesus doesn't seem to understand. And all these people are in his house laughing. And Jesus is like, get those people out of here. Now the last miracle, there was Oh, the people on the hillside and the pigs, and that was all frantic and loud. And then there was the crowd where the woman was healed and there were lots of people around. But this time, it's quiet and it's tender and it's a personal miracle. So Jesus takes the grieving parents into the girl's bedroom where she is lying. They had tried everything. They had waited and waited for things to get better. And now the girl has died and she's all alone. She's at the gates of death alone. But Jesus is there and he takes her by the hand and he says, Talitha, kum, little girl, get up. Why? In a story originally written in Greek that we read in English, why do we get this phrase, Talitha, kum, in Aramaic? Because there's something tender about a phrase that's used in your own language. What he's saying, when he's saying Talitha Kum, that's like what you might say in the morning to your child, little girl, time to wake up. Just as you might, if you were in a different country, if Jesus was someplace else, he might have said, bonjour petite, 
or Buenos Dias Bocanya, or Muco Upenye. He's just saying, rise and shine, sweetheart. It's time to get up. And I love that. Jesus is using these tender words that a parent would say to a child. It's time to rise up and be restored to the loving family who are so happy to see you again. So this girl, just like the man in the dramatic healing with the pigs, and just like the woman, she, they had been suffering for a long time. But now Jesus is looking at them with love and saying, you are healed, you are free, you are restored, and you are loved. What if this was the story of your life? And I mean, you're not chained up in a graveyard, you're not in a crowd and trying to reach out to Jesus. But this is the story of what is happening to you. Maybe there's a problem in your life that you are desperate for someone to fix. Maybe it's embarrassing. Maybe it's destructive to you or to other people. Maybe you've tried and tried and tried everything you could think of. You've tried your own willpower. You've tried experts and nothing makes it go away. Maybe you feel like even God is paying attention to everyone else's problems, but not yours. Maybe you're scared of the evil forces in the world. Maybe you're worried about your family. Maybe you're sad that what you wanted to happen didn't happen. And all three of these stories today, they were suffering and they were waiting. I don't know why God does it like that, but he does. And we know that if we are have to wait, it's not because we did something wrong. It's because that's the way that God works. It says in Romans five that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope and hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts. When our suffering causes us to continue hoping that hope doesn't put us to shame because we know that God is loving us while we wait. He sees us when other people might only see the problem. He knows us when we feel insignificant in a crowd of people. He is aware of where we are, even when we feel desperately alone. And not only that, he looks at us with love and warmth. The gaze of a father looking at a beloved child saying, daughter, son, little girl, little boy, you belong, you are noticed and you are loved. If that has happened for you in the past, if he has healed you, if he has restored you, if he has set you free, if he has looked at you with that gaze of love and you felt it, how much God loves you, make sure that you remember that today. Make sure you think back to that time or times where you knew God's love and just thank him for that. And if you're one of those people that's still suffering, still waiting, perhaps you're going to keep waiting until heaven but one day we know that love that has been poured into our hearts, that Jesus will look us in the face and say, you have been set free. So some of us, we keep waiting. We remember that he loves us and we travel on with this journey with him, loving Jesus and being loved by him.